Hello, and welcome to the Paul Cardall Podcast. Did you know the best way to support your favorite musician is to bypass social media and go to their website and subscribe to their mailing list? Going directly to the artist's website ensures you and the artist will have no third party controlling your relationship. It's a direct contact. Please show your support, particularly for our host. Go to Paul's website and subscribe, followed by other artists you enjoy. Visit www.paulcardall.com. You're going to enjoy today's podcast. We go down this rabbit hole and it gets better and better as the podcast progresses. Peter Breinholt is one of the most intelligent, gifted musicians out of Utah that I've known. Sort of a mentor, he, uh, inspired by Simon and Garfunkel and Cat Stevens, but uh, very successful. And what about all the September moons? And what about all the flowers in June? And what about all the times that I sit here and wonder? And uh, there's a time where his music was put into Mormon bookstores. There are some 250 bookstores at the time before streaming music took place that sold cassettes and CDs. And we're going to go down this rabbit hole of the history of commercial Mormon music. <laughs> and what a uh, rabbit hole it can be. <laughs> uh, it, I am with... Uh, a friend of mine who I have respected for so many years. In fact, when I first started my career, I was seeking out musicians in my community in Salt Lake City who were doing music, who were playing shows, who had their music in music stores, which was difficult because it's local music. And a lot of it gets blended in to LDS music, which is commercial music, by people within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And you will know these, uh, the, the, the nickname is Mormon. And so when we say Mormon music, for you that are LDS, don't be offended. This <laughs> is a word that, this is a word that we're no longer uh, supposed to say. Um, and Peter's been a friend and I learned so much from him because when I was seeking to understand the business prior to getting into it, as I mean, I think I'd only played the piano for a couple of years. I knocked on Peter's door just randomly and <laughs> tracked him down to try to figure out what he's doing. And he was gracious in first overcoming the shock of who the heck is this? And secondly, he was willing to mentor me for a season. And I even got an opportunity at one point to open for his show, which my music is so different mm -hmm. from, from yours, Peter, because you are heavily influenced by a lot of the seventies, Simon and Garfunkel, Cat Stevens, mm -hmm. uh, more of a folk, uh, pop Americana. Would I say yeah. that? Is that correct? Sure. Yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. And so you were so successful at doing sellout shows for, Students who went to Brigham Young University, this is one of the biggest schools in the United States, and it attracts Latter-day Saints from all over the world. Yes. Um, you know, I came, you and I came, we both came up in the, uh, under the umbrella of Mormonism, but, but my, but we, our family experiences were pretty different. And, and I, I bring that up because it, it's going to affect how we approach music ultimately. Um, so you were from a very devout. Oh, you need to get that. No, sorry. That's my, that's my ringtone. Who can it be now by men at work? Oh. <laughs> I should do, I should do Paul McCartney. I should do wings. Not who someone's knocking on the door. Sorry. <laughs> Interrupted by men at work. So that, we're men at work right now. So sorry. Yeah, that's perfect. Anyway, you came from a pretty devout Orthodox Mormon home. I, I came from a home, we were out of state when, for some of my childhood, and I'm only bringing this up because we were not particularly involved in church growing up, and so I wasn't, we're going to get into the different eras of Mormon music, but I was oblivious to Mormon music, I was, I was Simon and Garfunkel, like you said, I was, you know, 
uh, every, you know, I was just popular mainstream music. And that's going to come up, I think, because in both of our stories, um, whether we wanted the, the label or the tag or not, we, you know, you, you get it and we can get into we can get into why that happens. But I've always just thought of myself as a I'm going to write songs that are good. I'm just going to write good songs, songs that feel real to me and authentic to me. And I, I never, you know, artists don't like to be labeled at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, you know, we'll get into the story of how you know you once said to me. Uh, um, I remember you can only be a you know that saying. I'm, I'm not a Mormon musician. I'm a musician who's Mormon. A lot of people say that, and it's actually I think a pretty good thing to say. I mean, it's a good way of of, of it's a, it, that's the perspective of a lot of people. And I, but then I remember once you added but you can only be a musician who's Mormon for so long if you're successful before you become a Mormon musician, because they, t you know, they tend to get co-opted by the, by the culture. So is that, do you remember saying that? I do. And I saw that over the 25 years that I was actually in the business and doing uh, a large portion of my business with Deseret book, which is hundreds of bookstores and they're like a gift shop. They hate that phrase, but it's a place to go in and purchase books, art, music. And um, I say this because um, in the Christian market, you have stores like this and it's become, you know, almost a billion dollar business. You get into these stores all over the country and then you would be pit as a Christian and a, an example I'll give you is a rapper who I love is Lecrae. And when Lecrae started, he he was doing rap about his conversion to Christ, about being called to Christ, having grown up in a, in a difficult neighborhood, going to a youth camp and being pulled out of the world that his uncle had gone down, which is where he's in, you know, was in prison. And he wanted a better life for himself. So he started rapping and, mm -hmm. and talking about Christ. And then he starts winning all the Dove Awards, which is the gospel music awards for that vast Christian market. Um, and so he got labeled. And so when he gets nominated for a Grammy, he doesn't get nominated as a rapper. He gets nominated as a Christian. So it's CCM music or gospel music. And he gets into that category. However, I will tell you, it did come full circle for him as he's worked hard. Um, when I went to the Grammys and it was the 50th anniversary of rap, they put on the screen all of the influential rappers and there was his name. Oh, the, oh. Next to Run DMC. You know, I bet that was a moment for him. I mean, if that, I get that, I get that. If that were... That, I bet that was a great moment. Yeah. I don't know what his intentions were with his music, but if it were me, I would. that would mean a lot. Yeah. And so in our world, and, and this is why it's great that I come from this other background and you come from that other world is because you went out and you did, uh, you just wrote songs and performed your music and it was just beautiful stuff. Everyone connected with it. You had drums in your music. <laughs> uh, uh, LDS services on Sunday, you can't have drums. You, it's very particular, but, um, I was down this path of, I went to seminary and we would get a seminary teacher as, as we would enter into the building. Uh, this was a class we would take during high school. That was an elective. Um, we'd hear a lot of this music. This was commercial music, music that was being sold in Deseret Book that was teaching Mormon theology. And I loved it. I loved it. It was about Jesus from the from the perspective of, of LDS theology. And I fell in love with it. And I felt like I was getting, you know, a testimony. And you were being fed. Oh, big time. If you feel trapped inside a never ending night, if you've forgotten how it feels to feel the light If you're half crazy 
Thinking you're the only one Who's afraid the light will never really come Just hold I don't care what faith you're in when you listen to that music that's produced by those artists you're gonna feel closer uh to christ just like those of us that listen to contemporary christian music and i see a lot of day a lot of latter-day saints now embracing it byu has actually a tv show called grace notes mm -hmm. where they've brought all these artists in and it's just a beautiful blending of people who love god so you're you're right. Well, first, the, maybe the first thing I would say about Utah, specifically Utah, and and you know this, Paul, people, <clears throat> because of the social network that the church provides, when things catch on, they it's like a wildfire. And so there, there's a term mega mega trends. You'll get mega trends, and it's it, you you get them from everything from juice shops. You remember Zuka juice? That was a mega trend, and. <laughs> Um, you know, you, it, it's just, uh, just the byproduct of a very tight knit, but large community. I know a lot of the music that is in the services is remembrance music yeah. and <clears throat> has a very reverent spirit. It's remembering, um, the sacrifice that Jesus made and the sacrifice our ancestors made in their conversion and traveling so far and the struggles they faced in order to um have what was created and they would bring out the fiddle and they would sing a lot of the songs that were popular in the pubs only they would change the lyrics and when the first hymn book came out um the joseph smith's wife emma was asked to put together the hymn book and so you know back then it was like the contemporary music of their time and then fast forward you see the the evolving instruments and you're right because when, when i would start out doing solo piano records and then i was like i wonder if i can add a cello could i perform in church with an extra cello i think too our experience was shaped by you know we were both at one point missionaries and, and the missionary program has strict rules about what the missionaries can listen to. And in my era, you know, 1990, 89, I think the rule was, um, I think the rule was either instrumental. I I'd heard some, at one point I heard it had to be over a hundred years old, maybe, but I don't remember that being the rule, but, um, anyway, as, as you had tried to decide and navigate that, what can I listen to and still feel prepared to teach? You did think you're like, well, that has a you know, that has electric guitar or that. Has, and it's, <laughs> it was kind of like, I don't know. It, it, it was, I think, I think it is actually matured. Uh, I think that program is matured in that. I think it's much more like you find what makes you feel close to God. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it was, but it was, it was in that era, my era, kind of, I, it kind of um, formulaic in that way, and it actually, if, you know, it did, it it shaped the way I sort of viewed what is holy music and what is not. Where did you serve your mission? Down in South America and Chile. Were you allowed to listen to anything but the Tabernacle Choir because that was one of the. That was one of the rules in a lot of missions. You can only listen to the Tabernacle Choir or, uh, which I was grateful, you could listen to piano uh, hymns. What was the rule there? My memory was the rule, and it, it was it really depended on who was presiding over each mission. It would change a little bit. So the person over my mission, uh, it seemed like it was instrumental. Uh, and so that gave me a big opening. I, so I listened to a lot of George Winston. Okay. Uh, on my mission okay and <clears throat> and then um what was the other um t tabernacle choir for sure and then classical yeah 
Yeah, that, that was it. And then it seemed like because some of this early contemporary 80s stuff we're talking about, Michael McLean, because his music was featured in all these promotional church videos that were going out, I think his music was able to creep into my mission. And and so I list that's where I got exposed to, to his stuff. And that did that did feel a little more like contemporary. <clears throat> Michael is one of the biggest selling songwriters and his albums have sold millions just through the church bookstores. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> my dad worked on, uh, worked at KSL and kind of for Bonneville. And he remembers, um, well, it was actually my uncle Ross worked with him on creating, remember those Mormon messages? Yeah. It's like from the Mormons. Yeah. And so he told me that he told me this story of Michael McLean would come into the room and he would stand on the desk, like a cheerleader, excited to tell and pitch the yeah. commercial and the music that was going to go into it. And I fell in love with Michael's music because it was feeding us with moral values and humility and recognizing our value. Oh, for, you can go, your your viewers can go onto YouTube now. And if they search Mormon Homefront ads, they they were called Homefront ads. And those actually started in the late seventies. And Michael McLean was one of the early writers. And I remember, you know, in Pennsylvania and I'm in fourth grade and I remember you'd be watching TV and then in between the Folgers coffee ad and the San Francisco restaurant ad, all of a sudden there'd be this ad about this woman who was very lonely and there'd be this beautiful music. And then at the end of the ad, you know, a little boy in the park bench would smile at her and then, she, and, and that's how it ended. And it would have like a little tagline at the end, you know, like, isn't it about time? That's one of the family. You, know, you remember that one? Yeah. They, they were, they were, I think they won Addy awards. Um, they, they were they were really good, and it, a lot of it was based on the music, on on the songs, on it. And you would find yourself in the middle of the day crying, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> watching these commercials. They were very good. Dad, will you please play ball with us? No, not right now, son. I got to finish painting. I put it off way too long already. Son, let me show you how to swing that bat. Put that off too long too. Life's magic moments. It's often life's small moments that bring the greatest memories. Don't let the magic pass you by. Don't let the magic pass you by. From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the start. I think I I think the home front ads was also start part of the early shift into what would eventually become Mormon contemporary music. Did you ever hear the plan? By the Osmonds? Uh, I didn't at the time. I've gone back because it's become, I think it's become an album in retrospect that people um, it, it consider as significant. And um, so, yeah, I, that was early 70s something. And they they consider that, you know, I looked at the Wikipedia page for, for Mormon music and they, they cite the plan as maybe the real start of yeah. Mormon contemporary music because it charted yeah. the Osmonds. It was in the top 40. But it was a very theological, you know, it was laying out Mormon theology in rock music. It's like a rock, it's like a rock opera. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So tell me who am I? Why am I here? Where in heaven's name am I going? I got traffic in my mind. Yeah. Don't know which one to follow. Yeah, Donny Osmond. Murray Osmond, everybody knows who they are. And I met people on my mission who said they joined the church because they love Donny Osmond. They were wearing purple socks. <laughs> Donny loved purple socks. And uh, um, yeah, they were fantastic. And the plan was kind of like one of those epic, because back in that time, they were doing like storytelling records, like Rush was doing 21 12. Yeah, yeah, concept yeah. albums concept album so they released the plan debuted in the top 40 and uh that yeah that was the beginning of the story and the theology of mormonism going out i, I gotta tell you i gotta tell you real fast paul that years later so in the 
sorry, we're jumping all over, but in, in the, in the two thousands, uh, I was over in England with my wife and she surprised me one day, like we're going to Liverpool and we're going to go on a Beatles tour. We're going to get on a double decker bus and it's going to take us down Penny Lane and strawberry fields. And it's really cool. So we go on that and behind us, there's a mother and a daughter and they're on the same tour and we get talking to them. And when they found out we were from Utah, they both almost fainted because the mom loved Don because the, the Osmonds were really, really big in England. Um, uh, and it, it resembled Beatlemania for a time, only it was American. It was the opposite Amer- American group. There's a documentary about it, but, and, but the daughter, I, we, the daughter was equally excited because she loved the killers. <laughs> and so it's, 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 we'll get to the killers, but uh, it, 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 you know, very, and you're right. People have become, people have become acquainted with Mormonism and sometimes joined it because of Donnie Osmond or Brandon Flowers. Yeah. We can talk about the killers for a minute. They're one of the best concerts I've ever been to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love their music. You, obviously you probably do too, but um, I was watching this pretty well-known podcast and um it pops up on tiktok and the guy looks at his friend and goes you know the killers are christian he goes what no 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 he goes they're mormon christian they're like what no 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 and he's like read the lyrics if you go into those lyrics you're gonna hear mormon theology and he's like you know i think you're right in fact, the killer's last uh, album cover, um, the one before the one about him growing up in, in Nephi, in, in Nephi, but the one before that had a painting of of this. It's it's a Native American painting of uh, a father and a mother in a cloud moving across the land. And though it's not particularly um, Mormon doctrine, but there's that idea that there's the mother and the father god the father and god the mother and so he, he put it right there on the album cover yeah yeah and and i i gotta i gotta work in another little story because it's gonna again we're all we're moving we're out of order here but i ran an interview once early on where brandon you know they come out of vegas killers come out of vegas and they're kind of my memory is when they came out they kind of seemed like he was seemed very edgy he'd wear makeup uh, he'd wear eyeliner and it was it, it, the Music kind of had a punk feel, a new wave feel. And, you know, I think they kind of were perceived as a kind of a wild band. Mm-hmm. And then somebody in, in in a journalist in an interview said, I heard you were, you were, you grew up Mormon, that you used to be Mormon. And Brandon Flowers, and this is early on, he's like, What do you mean? I used to be, I am a Mormon. Mm-hmm. And and the interviewer's like, well, What are you talking about? You, you know, you you drink and uh, I mean, I don't know the detail, but you, you know, you yeah. Seems like you're you're not living the Mormon life, and he was so innocent about it. Like Brandon Flowers, he's like, well, everybody has their thing. They're you know they're working through. He didn't see any despair. He didn't see any disconnect at all between being a Mormon and being a rock star, and and that was fascinating to me because, you know, even Elvis was conflicted about it. Johnny Cash was conflicted about it. But Brandon Flowers seems so innocent about it. Like, I don't, what's the problem? And I, you know, maybe that'll, we can get to that when we it, we get to that point in the story of Mormon music, where we actually start to see music coming out of Mormon culture, regardless of affiliation or regardless of belief systems that it's just, that's an actually exciting chapter in, in the story of Mormon music. But, well, I tell my friends, uh, you can take, the boy out of Mormonism, but you can't take Mormonism out of the boy. The same goes with Brandon. Yeah, yeah. let's dive back because after the uh, plan, um, and that was the 70s, there was a group who tried to kind of emulate that acapella. We have a lot of acapella groups that evolved in the 80s and 90s, uh, early 2000s, that uh, um, because they loved the nylons in the jungle, you know, sleep in the jungle. Yeah. And then, but, but you had, um, my mind goes a little blank, but you had this group that wanted to emulate kind of the acapella with the music of the Osmonds called Afterglow. Oh yeah. 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 
Afterglow. <laughs> Which apparently is not a good name. I don't, I still don't know why. <laughs> don't Google it. But that was the name, meaning you would feel God's spirit and then you would just glow about uh, having the countenance of Christ. They, they eventually rebranded, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it was. McClausen and Payne. McClausen and Payne. <laughs> McClausen and Payne, their last names. Well, the pain's not good. good. Well, with the music, it's like you feel the pain and you feel grateful for God. <laughs> A lot, of suffering. a lot of suffering, though. So gratitude for that and uh, grow through that. I am the captain, the captain of my soul. But they were, they were, they came out of the 80s and they were a blockbuster group. And I, you know, they opened the doors for, uh, I mean, it was, I don't know how to define their music. It, it was just more contemporary and, but very overtly religious. Beautiful. It, but it with, had... you know, but with, but with contemporary music underneath it. Yeah. And they kind of squeezed in by doing hymns in the beginning. Yeah. So it was like hymns and it was like, not your typical hymns you would hear in church. You'd go to the, the bookstore. The main point of the bookstore was so that the the leaders of the church could could write their books and um, have their have it um, go out into the public. And then Hilder Bednar told me that all the money from any book that's sold goes into the missionary department, that they don't get any money, which mm. I thought was beautiful, um, even though some people would uh, uh, create some conspiracy about that. But it says here on their website, in 1984, Deseret Book. So Deseret Book had a record label. They signed Afterglow to a contract and have recorded 17 albums. And most of their albums feature the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Yeah. Those in the 80s were very expensive. Yeah. 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 And I I don't remember if, if Deseret Book was actually manufactured, if they were doing records. Um, I do know they were, they had tons of tapes and then eventually CDs, but it was like a mini, it was a mini record label yeah. in, in the A's. And that, that opened the door for a lot of, um, you know, a lot of these acts to come out. Kenneth Cope comes out of that. Um, let's talk about Kenneth Cope. Someone named me after Mormon, trying to turn the world against me because of faith etched in gold. But that name has stood for goodness And its fame now floods the nations By the words Mormon wrote Yeah, Kenneth, I don't remember when I now, became aware of him More in the 90s, I think he hit his stride in the 90s But he started in the 80s And he was just a, he was a soloist, a songwriter He's a good singer And for about half a year in college I was a I was a cashier at a Deseret book. Okay. And that was my first, you know, despite the mission experience where I was listening to my George Winston uh, and Michael McLean, that's where I became really familiar with for the first time with these early acts. And Kenneth Cope really was starting to sort of break through. And you remember this was like in 1990, Amy Grant um, yeah. in the Christian scene had, she'd, she'd come out with an album in motion. I think it was called. And that was, I think, a crossover into, into, she had to top 40 hits on that album. But for, I don't know how many years prior, a whole decade at least, she was doing over in the Christian, the, the larger Christian market, what I think after Glow Kenneth Cope, these guys were starting to sort of follow, yeah. take her cue in the Mormon. And, and Deseret Book was the, you know, it was the structure that. Yeah. Yeah, that Amy Grant record, uh, yeah. my friend is uh, Bart Millard from Mercy Me, and that was the record that he heard during the time that he was being abused and went to youth camp and found his relationship with the Lord and <clears throat> evolved into his, you know, his band Mercy Me today. Um, do you remember the first song that from from Kenneth Cope? Do you know, do you remember any of the songs? 
because he the had big, a- the big ones for Mormons is his hands. Mm-hmm. Um, his hands. There, oh, he had one that was one album that was the biggest album. I'll have to Google it. Greater, you know what I'm talking about? Greater, greater than a song. Yeah. And there are two or three songs off his hands. And then there's another big one that was like his two big. He did a, uh, well, on, on his hand, on, on greater than us all, the album, he had, um, I'll believe in him and face to face about the day that you actually see God face to face. And then he had the album all about, uh, Joseph Smith from the narrative that was taught to us for so many years prior to the the papers being published but it's this narrative of what joseph smith endured and on my mission that's where i got a lot of the theology you know you listen to the sermons of leaders and you do this in seminary but you actually start to pay attention as you get older and so that album came out we got to listen to my servant joseph as a missionary or as a yeah 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 Yeah, we got to listen to it he would definitely Sorry. No, go ahead. Well, he would definitely, by that point, he would definitely be welcomed into the missionary program. Never a greater hero. That was the other one I was thinking of. That was a, yeah, that's, that's his number one. If you Google it. Yeah. It came out in 89. Never a better hero. Never a true Yeah. And he had other uh, big hits, and then he he kind of released a couple things like in the late two thousands. But he's a photographer, and I don't know what else he's doing. But he uh, and then do you remember Michael Webb? Yeah, yeah, Michael Webb. Um, one of my friends. Um, we were just talking about Michael Webb because one of my friends. Um, I think Michael Webb's from Holiday, where you grew up, Paul. Yeah, or was living there at least during the '80s when he was doing some of these early albums. So, our common friend Mike Waterman was brought in to play a little guitar on some of those early albums, and he and they just recorded them, I think, um, pretty primitively. But Michael Webb and he's had a he's had a really fascinating journey as well. Yeah, he's been a he's been a worship leader actually in a yeah. in a uh, non denominational church. <clears throat> One of the best songs I've heard from him actually came out a couple of years ago called My Jesus. Oh, I'll check it out. And Growing Old. Am I becoming more faithful? Am I growing more grateful? Am I looking more like you? Am I growing? just growing older and and he says he says am i growing closer to god or am i just growing old Hmm. it's a great great line and uh yeah i love his music still and a lot of these guys don't put too much out well yeah i I, like in kenneth's case you know we've moved but we were for a, a while um not too far from me. He's in Mill Creek. I was in holiday. It doesn't mean anything to most of your listeners, but you know, his daughter and my son started hanging out in high school. And, okay. and um, so I'd, I'd kind of get, you know, get, get updates. And he, he had been a, a bishop. Um, and I, it, I get the sense that, and this is, I'm not surprised by this. He, he really focused on that calling. Yeah. You know, he spent the five years or so, just really, really going above and beyond as a, you know, visiting homes and serving, you know, and I think I didn't hear, you know, not a lot. I'm I'm not aware of a lot of music that came out during that time. I didn't know about the photography, but, you know, there's been, he was talking for a long time about this sort of magnum opus, this project uh, centered around Jesus's life. Yeah. And it's out. It's out. Okay. It's out. It's uh, epic. It's epic. It's uh, very ambitious, but he wanted to learn how to do all the orchestration himself. Okay. He wanted to learn. And so he spent years, I think he spent like 20 years working on it. I have come for love. I have come. 
sensitive i found him to be so obsessed and passionate about that personal relationship with jesus to where it seemed like he had weeded out a lot of things that idols that had kept him from that whether it's ambition or whatever but he was very instrumental but i you know we're talking about men there's a couple of women in there like felicia Sorensen mm-hmm. and, yeah. and and julie de azaveda <clears throat> mm-hmm And we will be right back. Not only is Paul a podcast host, but has gifted the world with award-winning music that's brought comfort to millions of listeners in more than 160 nations. His latest album, Return Home, is an introspective listening experience. Each song, carefully crafted, takes listeners on a cinematic journey to the lands of his ancestors. Whether you just need to relax, study, meditate, pray, or for some other healthy reason, Paul's music helps create an atmosphere of peace wherever you are. Add Paul Cardall's album Return Home to your favorite platform, whether it's iTunes, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, Pandora, or some other. For the sheet music and more information, visit www.paulcardall.com. Like Felicia Sorensen mm-hmm. and, yeah. and and Julie D. Azevedo. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. And they start to emerge, it seems like in the 90s a little bit. <clears throat> Although Julie, you know, Julie is the daughter of uh, a prominent Mormon musician who mm-hmm. wrote those 70s, you know, those two albums I mentioned, My Turn on Earth and Saturday's Warrior. And along comes Julie. And she's she's coming to come in up through that desert book. Um path and actually i think her dad had his own label uh, apart from desert uh, news aubergine aubergine records and lex did play for the osmonds and was one of their yeah. orchestrators and had a, a pretty big gig in the 70s in hollywood doing jingles and doing all kinds of things so he yeah. started the label signed kenneth cope signed julie his daughter and um they created x x was it was it XL Entertainment or was it something else right before that? He had a, oh, it's, it might have been XL. And then was that was, I think Jeff Simpson, somebody bought that. Um, he had a retail, he had a studio. I recorded my first album in his studio. And then behind it was a retail store. It was called Light Wave or something. It was, it, they'd sell tapes and they'd tell say, music. So, so Lex was not only a composer, he was a, a record label person and a, um, a venue like he would build venues he was a real businessman that helped the scene and so out of that comes se- several of his kids got into the music but julie is very interesting because she did her run of albums i think her most famous song of the of the overtly religious phase for her was um window to his soul i think it was called and uh, and masterpiece And then, she, and then, and then, the late '90s, she um, starts to. There's still. Uh, there's maybe a little less overt, and that, that that and she did some good stuff there. But then, <clears throat> she I don't know when this happened, but she goes back to school and and eventually gets a PhD and really redef- redefines her, her professional career entirely. 
Mm-hmm. And now she's a, a, a therapist and an influencer and a, and a personnel, you know, and a, and she's, she's, I mean, she's gone far beyond in, in terms of influence, scope of influence. She's gone far beyond uh, whatever she did with, with what she's gone far beyond as a, as what she's doing now as she did as a musician. I lived it's, her, it's been pretty cool. She's amazing. I lived in her neighborhood and she has one of the most powerful podcasts for latter-day uh, parents, uh, particularly investing a lot of time on talking about the value of young women and how to navigate sexuality through life. Uh, so I recommend that if if you're interested from that perspective. But yeah, she was one of those like Hillary Weeks who, you know, a mom who mm-hmm. has done a lot of albums for Deseret Book. Check her out. But um, what happened in the 80s? Uh, that that we know is Jeff Simpson came around. Jeff Simpson was a producer at Disney when they used to have the movie night or something. And um, he was a producer. And so then he came to Salt Lake and formed XL Entertainment and kind of took over what Lex had built. I think he, he I, I may be wrong, but I think he bought it. And so he started, but what his ambitions were, ambitions uh, project was is let's actually go into the gospel music association at their conferences set up a like set up a booth at a trade show get involved in that with the opportunity to try to integrate uh contemporary lds music into the gospel music yeah. association <laughs> yeah, which, a little rude awakening i think yeah <laughs> some of my friends now in the gospel music remember Jeff coming and being so excited and they're great friends. And, you know, that led to, I'm kind of jumping forward, but Jason Deere, who's a producer in Nashville and one of the projects he created that kind of crossed over, not necessarily in the gospel music world, but into the country world uh, here in Nashville was uh, the Nashville Tribute Band. Yeah. So I remember Jason Deere because he was kind of the, I don't know if he was an A&R guy or a producer, but he, Shadezy uh, was uh, Jason. He was associated. He did, Ryan Shoup, I think was, was with Jason. So he had these, I'm missing a few, but he, but then he kind of did, it sounds like he did his own, put his own group together, National Tribute Band. And I think there was an appetite for that. Again, we're all over the place now in terms of timeline, but there was an appetite for reconnecting with sort of pioneer early Mormon music. And so you get groups like the Lower Lights, uh, which struck a chord where they wanted to do these old pioneer songs with sort of folk and bluegrass musicians, but give it a sort of contemporary feel. They're great. I use a lot of, you know, I a lot of musicians I play with or, or with Lower Lights, but National Tribute Band did it slightly differently, but yeah, they, they ended up, uh, they ended up doing, yeah, having a good run. <clears throat> I saw them at Michael W. Smith, who's kind of the godfather of Christian music. Uh, I saw them at his farm doing some event. And so that he was actually in Michael W. Smith's barn. This was something that Desert Book had arranged. This was probably three years ago, I went to this fundraiser. I didn't even have a clue that um, Laurel Christensen, who is the president of Desiree Book right now, and 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 Jason and his group would be there. And I was kind of like, oh, I guess Jeff Simpson's vision has come full circle. Yeah. Because they're in the, they, they got the red carpet rolled out for this event. Um, and you also have to give Jeff, cre- Jeff credit because Jeff, Jeff comes in from California, he grew up in Utah, but he goes and works for Disney, comes in and he's a real, he's got energy. He's got a real entrepreneurial mind. So he comes, buys Excel and then he's trying everything. Right. And, and, you know, he tries to loop in some of like, I'm, you know, I've, I've got a bunch of contemporaries. We have a scene going that's not really, you know, aligned with Desert Book or anything like that, but he tries to bring us in. But then, but then the real story was, um, he gets into film and mm. this is in the early two thousands where you start to get these independent filmmakers making Mormon themed movies. 
And there's a breakout hit called God's Army. And Jeff is right at the center of that. And Jeff, you know, it turns into its own scene. And Jeff deserves, I think, in terms of the distribution and the platform, I think Jeff deserves most of the credit for what for that, even to this day. There's no question. He is the pioneer of <clears throat> transforming uh, LDS music into the public uh, sector, people knowing more about uh, LDS music and what it exists. He even created uh, kind of a Dove Award uh, event mm -hmm. where, you know, the Gospel Music Association has the Dove Awards where they award the uh, all the gospel people. And he created the Pearl Awards. In fact, right behind me, <laughs> this way. Uh, you got your Pearl Awards? I got my two Pearl Awards next to my Dove. <laughs> <laughs> way to go i don't know where my pearl award went so good for you <laughs> well one of them has uh stephen sharp nelson's name on it so let's talk about steve for a minute um because he is he is a he is the glue that has helped countless musicians that we all know in the beginning and now he's playing massive venues with a friend of ours, John Schmidt, who was a pianist that I tried to emulate, but realized I can't play Bach. I can't play baked. I just had to do my quiet reverence stuff, but I always wanted to pound. And uh, I say that with respect because he's like a Billy Joel that brings you in to the piano where you're just enthralled um, yeah. to create. And they created the piano guys. Um, but let's go back to, you know, you're forming your band what's the story with getting steve involved because i think he was in, was he in junior high school when you started using it no he was he was uh i think he's probably a, a 15 year old um sophomore and um so i the way i remember it is that i went to a school in salt lake city that i don't know if it's coincidence or what but a lot of a lot of talented people came out of it, including John Schmidt. So John Schmidt was a senior when I was a freshman. And my memory of going to school assemblies was that at least once at every assembly, they would bring John out to play whatever his latest song was. And I remember one, you know, I remember the, the time he came and said, this is a song I just wrote called waterfall and here goes. And he played it. And I, it was the first time I think, you know, anybody, in the audience had heard that song. And so that was my first awareness of John. And then John graduates and then I stay at Highland and then um, flash forward, you know, in college, I start to do performances and um we had somebody approach us to open a show. Her name was Suzanne Middleton. She's a pianist. And I said, sure. It's actually at Highland High, but now we were all in college. And I said, sure. She's a pianist. And she said, can I bring some string players? And they're all Highland High students. Yeah. And, and so she had this. And I said, yeah. And can I use them? Because I'd always wanted to incorporate. I'm a, you know, I love the Beatles. I always wanted to incorporate strings. And so... She said, sure. And so I met with these, they're all kids. They're all high school kids. And I met with them to rehearse and I wrote up some, you know, I used Finale, which was the software at the time. And I wrote, they were like chords. They just play chords. But I thought I liked the way it built the songs. And the, and the most, the most, in my memory, the most engaged of the quartet kids was this cellist who was super I, he just had the eye of the tiger, man. He just, um, he was there. He wanted to be there. He wanted to help. He offered to help arrange. And so that started a relationship where, you know, we did the gig, but then I started calling Steve, you know, and other string players as I met him to start playing at all of our shows. And that lasted for what, so that gig would have been in 1993, I think. Mm -hmm. And I don't know until what year Steve was not only just performing, but helping me arrange parts, you come over to my house. And so, you know, you know, Paul, whenever if you're trying to run any sort of 
thing, whether it's a band or a company, you know, or a school, you gravitate to those guys who just make your life easier, who like, like share in the burden. Yeah. And and you spot them right away. And, and Steve had that. He just was so on board. And so during those, we'll say a decade and a half of Steve uh, sitting in with our group, he starts that enthusiasm starts getting him in every door possible where people are. I think by the time he was started piano guys, he had played on, I think I'd heard he played on a hundred local Utah albums. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and are you surprised? I remember he was trying to juggle his calendar because he had one of your shows. He had recordings. He had my shows. He had other people's shows and it was hard to get him. And, and, one of the friends of his that started helping him compose and create was Marshall McDonald, who is a brilliant conductor and composer. And, and together, the two of them had uh, helped me do my song Redeemer. And I don't know if Marshall ever helped with some of your projects, but these guys together were kind of the new Kurt Bester and uh, Sam Carden. Sam Carden. Um, I said to Steve, I said, you know, Yo-Yo Ma's selling a lot of records. Would you come to my little label and do an album called Sacred Cello? And he's like, nobody wants to buy cello music from me. I said, Steve, people want the hymns with a cello. It's what you hear in sacrament services. He did it and it debuted at number 18 on the classical charts. And that just, I mean, I can't even imagine how he felt but I just had to let go after that because I was like, man, he's on his own. He's going to soar. He's going to just. And now the piano guys, I mean, they they dominate uh, the Billboard charts. There's been a lot of LDS musicians who have dominated the piano guys, you know. Lindsey Sterling. Yeah. Lindsey Sterling, the Tabernacle Choir, obviously. Imagine Dragons. Imagine I mean... Dragons. And these are bands that. So there's a couple bands that. We're never in the LDS bookstores. Imagine Dragons, The Killers. Um, there's a lot of other bands. Donny Oz, the Osmonds were never really in Desert Book. You never really saw any of their stuff. You saw some of Maria Osmond. And we will be right back. Did you know the best way to support your favorite musician is to bypass social media and go to their website and subscribe to their mailing list? Going directly to the artist's website ensures you and the artist will have no third party controlling your relationship. It's a direct contact. Please show your support, particularly for our host. Go to Paul's website and subscribe, followed by other artists you enjoy. Visit www.paulcardall.com. Not only is Paul a podcast host, but has gifted the world with award-winning music that's brought comfort to millions of listeners in more than 160 nations. His latest album, Return Home, is an introspective listening experience. Each song, carefully crafted, takes listeners on a cinematic journey to the lands of his ancestors. In all, Return Home features 13 songs, from his original piano pieces, Shropshire Hills, Immigrant Ships, The Shores of Normandy, Red Poppy Fields, Fathers and Daughters, Eliza's Theme, to arrangements of popular hymns, I Believe in Christ and Love One Another. Whether you just need to relax, study, meditate, pray, or for some other healthy reason, Paul's music helps create an atmosphere of peace wherever you are. Add Paul Cardall's album Return Home to your favorite platform, whether it's iTunes, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, Pandora, or some other. For the sheet music and more information, visit www.paulcardall.com. So let's go back a minute to EFY. This is especially for youth. Tell us, uh, Peter, about EFY and um, what was happening there that changed LDS music. It was only for a little time, but what was happening? So EFY stands for especially for youth. And it was like a summer camp that emerged at, at BYU. So, you know, you've got a quiet campus 
uh, at BYU in the summer, just still students, but they decide to start doing these sort of youth camps. And it wasn't, I'm not even sure if the origins of it were the, if the church was putting their best foot forward here, or if it was BYU, or if it was more of a group of individuals who did it, but it just exploded. It was a week long. Kids started traveling from all over the country to come to BYU. And then they decided this is too big. So they started doing EFY Seattle, EFY Nashville, EFY New York. And as part of that, somewhere along the line, somebody said, you know, what would be cool is if we created an album because it probably came out of like, you know, they've got these like devotional meetings, I'm sure throughout, um, th throughout the week. And um, out of that probably came music. And so somebody said, and I think this probably would have been, I don't even know when it started the the album, but they started hiring producers out of the, you know, the Mormon music scene to produce. And what you'd get was, you know, 12 songs and each song would have a different singer, you know, and it was the, the, the common thread was the producer and they were all sort of thematic, you know, let's do a song about faith. Let's do a song about missionaries, you know, and I know that like, so the name that I'm just gonna throw out names, but Clive Romney, who, um, brilliant. Yeah. And Clive, Clive had, Clive was from a different generation. Clive was actually came, like came out of the seventies and had done some albums for children, you know, like, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but, um, so Clive and some other guys produced, I think the early EFY stuff. And what happened is, I don't know if this was due to the, you know, if this was caused by the albums being really being good or if it was just people, you know, the numbers of attendees was growing and kids wanted to remember the experience and that, you know, it's just so distribution was suddenly high, but the album just started to do, you know, they started to produce manufacture more and more and they started you you would I, I think you would just get I never went to you why Paul you may have did you just were you given an album a, I was a, a tape or a, I was a counselor for okay years. and so everyone that went received a copy in their bag and at the end of every album was the theme right or the conference for that year yeah every, one year had a theme and I'm on a and, and it was like forward with faith or remember yeah. the promise stuff like that. I'm on a and, website called on a website called singpraises.net. And the first record was in 1984. Wow. And the last one was in 2019 because the jerk yeah. changed the youth they, program. They did away with EFY. And that's that's so Paul, that is part of the story here because you know, in the 80s, not only do you have Michael McLean, Kenneth Cope, Afterglow, but then you have this album emerge and, and they would draw from those artists mm -hmm. and then they would write their own songs. And so I would say by the mid nineties, late nineties, the, the EFY album was um, big budget. Uh, they were bringing it. Kenneth Cope by that point was producing them. Um, and it started to, if I may add this for the full story, not everybody was a fan of them. I, I frankly wasn't a fan of them. To their credit, they were given only a, through the 80s and 90s, a budget of $20,000 to make a record. Yeah. yeah. So they were scratching at the surface to come up with ways to do it because I don't think people realize how expensive it is, particularly at that time. It was, for me to go in a studio at the time, it was $100 an hour, Yeah, which is why yeah. you went owning your own studio and today you can do anything out of your house and i remember i remember noticing whether it was efy or some of michael mcclain's albums i remember you know i i'm a kid who like i'm a kid who's forming bands in high school and i'm listening to the rolling stones and and i'm here suddenly i'm hearing this music come out of you know efy or, or desert book and i was like wow the production value on these is really good they had a studio downtown in Bonneville and Sam Carden and Kurt, Kurt Bester emerged and they were out of these BYU kids and they were next level in terms of production value. Mm -hmm. And, and so EFY benefited from, from that. And it just sort of grew. And, um, 
it didn't i i remember um at one point i thought this was at a stage in my life where i thought you know i need to i need to do everything i can to sort of help build this and so i and i was at a place in my career at that time where they they would listen to me and so i i i said uh you know i'd be happy to help produce one of these and i got a friend named john schmidt and he'll do it with me mm-hmm. and we and our whole concept going in as i recall and for me like this is me wanting to take a big thing and make it better and my whole philosophy was look it's 12 good songs all we care about is 12 good songs i don't care who sings them i don't care you know if we can get a message great but like i wanted them to feel like authentic songs the song kind of songs i would listen to mm-hmm. that had n- enough of a a sort of theme that efy would feel like you know this is instructional this is edifying this is fitting our mission and so john and i did our best and we 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 did the album in 2000 and then a broken man in his house one day he said he was a sheriff he knew how to pray then he tried and said what's in his heart so pure and easy yeah um and then uh and then i stepped away and and then I remember thinking again around 2008, maybe I'll do try it again because I think we can do better. Anyway, it's too autobiographical. I, I I did it this time with Russ Dixon. And um, anyway, I, I just remember sensing by that point, there was a sort of, um, there's a little, I don't want to call it politics, but there was a lot of influence around the process that really limited us. I mean, I had this vision and I just felt like they had what they had. It had worked for all those years. Don't mess with the formula. I came away a little frustrated from that one. And I thought, I, you know, I'm not their guy. I'm with you. I'm with you, uh, man. Because at that time, what were the name of those records? It was, there was, it was actually, sorry, I'm looking at all music. It was 1998, Join the Journey. That, that was Kenneth Cope. Oh, I was forward with, forward with faith. That was the one John and I did. Oh, Got to correct your all music. <laughs> dot com. Does it say I did the and it one? Gives you the credit on that. Maybe, and maybe I, you... I sang one half. I sang one line. Okay. On on one song on that. <laughs> oh, we should touch on that. The uh, taking it home, which is we are the world. Uh, yeah. BS artists for. <laughs> Yeah, the 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 '90s because they had this theme song, and then I think you you're, all you're, got together. you're getting into sort of sensitive territory for me because um, this isn't about me. I'm here to talk about you know the 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 the, the rise of Mormon music, but well, we're talking about the song because I think the song had big impact, and I felt like that song united people because there were different record labels, but you guys and and many independent like yourself. Uh, and you all came together and 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 did this song, whether people yeah. wanted to be on the song or not, you know, one of the one of the comments you make is to devote your time and talents to the building up of the kingdom of God. And so a lot of us, I think, felt, man, we gotta do it. We can't just say, can't say no, that. you're saying no to Jesus. Yeah who leads the church and uh, there was a lot of pressure. So, but yeah, so they brought us a b- bunch of us in. I remember Julie DeAzevedo's sister, Rachel was there and she was on her way out, you know, and, but she, I mean, for, I don't know for whatever reason she wanted to be there. And, and, um, and so, yeah, it was kind of a weird, the world and it did, it brought in a lot of independent artists, not desert book artists, a lot of people doing their own thing, trying to do their own way.
And I think the, the reason I said it's sort of sensitive spot is that, you know, this is 1998. Um, CDs are CDs are 10 years old, but we haven't gotten into Napster yet. We haven't gotten into really much of an online thing yet. And then especially iTunes. And so we didn't know how to. So what I'm getting at is if you if you search my name now on Apple or Spotify, it'll bring up these songs. And I didn't write these songs. I sang living in a world. I sang probably 15 words on that song. Oh, no. And, oh, no. and, and now it comes up on charts. Yeah. And I'm not, if you search, if you search my name now, the number one, is, let's say I perform in, you know, somebody flies me out. I perform in Chicago and somebody's like, wow, I like this guy. Who is he? And he searches me. It'll come up in order. And the number one, you can do it right now. The number one song for me is um, a song I did as a favor for somebody as a vocalist. I didn't sing it. I mean, I didn't write it. I didn't arrange it. And um, I love the guy and I was happy to do it, but I, I, I don't feel like it's inaccurate. It doesn't point people at people who are just trying to find out mm -hmm. who Peter Brianhold is. I, I wish it would lead it to my songs. And it's just, a, it's just a numbers thing. He, you know, it's been a very successful. Yeah. And since then, I, I think a lot of artists have been a lot, a lot more proactive about how the songs are sent out. Like, like, yeah. for example, do you remember Benton Paul? Uh-huh. So Benton yeah. Paul was on an EFY album, but this is 2008. And he, you know, he's a younger guy. He's, he's much more of a uh, savvy with, you know, he's a digital native as they call it. And he said, I'll sing on the album, but, you can't, I don't want my name listed as the artist. You can put this, you know, whoever the songwriter was or whatever, because I don't want this coming up when people search my name. Yeah. And and I think that was a, a good proactive move on his part. And this goes back to what we were talking about in the very beginning, where you don't <laughs> want to get classified into a genre because today, like on Spotify, because I started back then, it'll recommend artists that were of the same quality of my music back then. And I feel like my music has evolved to the point where you yeah. can put it mixed in with a lot of these modern classical composers because it's evolved. I only, listen, I always felt bad because you want to contribute, you want to be involved, you want to help. And I only got one track on the desert, on, on the, on what was the album it was called? This was an EFY record called Be Thou an Example in 2009. I wrote a song. Well, I arranged a song, Green Hill, which is Green Hill far away. But here's oh, the cool, yeah. here's the cool thing about that, Peter. Uh, the lead singer is was not LDS. The lead singer, Steel Crosswhite. I don't know how it got approved, but he is a worship pastor at the Rock Church and been my mentor for man, I would say 20 years and helped me through a lot of challenges in my life. So I I forgot completely that that song is on there with Sherry McGill. Oh yeah, Sherry, yeah. <laughs> Stab at it for a while. and But we started to see, I think then, the invitation to people outside the faith to come and be part of this. But before we move on, look, at EFY, the thing that was so awesome for the kids that gathered from all over the world is they were mixed with other people that they believed the same thing had had the same values so they would they would flirt they as a counselor we'd have to have them go have girls go one way and boys another because we'd find them making out in the park or little things like that nothing serious because they're it was amazing. They're all good kids, but we would have concerts at the end of the week and they were so mm. beautiful and colors was so engaging and entertaining. And you did some of those shows. Yeah. They, there and, was a, there was a stretch Paul where again, this is at a, like I look back on it. I'm like, I don't know if I do that now or, I, or if I went back in time, if I do it again, but at the time I, it was just so, exciting and i was just so like whatever you ask i'll do and so um what happened is i would say 97 98 those years um those concerts you're talking about had become 
I think they saw them as successful. And, and so they would, you know, by this point, you've got EFY sessions, you've got probably what, 35 sessions around the country. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of kids. Yeah. And so they would come to us. And I, when I say us, it's me, it's Ryan Shoup, Nancy Hansen, John Schmidt, you were probably coming in. No, and, I never, uh, they never had me. I was, I was funeral music at the time. I was, <laughs> I was sacrament reverent, you know, uh, uh, Col- so, so colors is one. And yeah. what they do is they'd come to us at the beginning of the summer and it's okay, here's the schedule. You guys tell us which shows you'd want to do. And they would, they would pay our, they'd fly us there, get us a hotel. And I think we got paid a little bit, but we're all single at the time. And, I'd say like, I'll take Nashville. I'll take, they did, you know, shoot. I always want to go to Alaska. Um, <laughs> I like the church history. I'd go to, you know, New York and <clears throat> anyway, Berlin. To, <clears throat> to whatever extent you wanted to travel and, and um, you, you could, you could do it. And it was, it was a fun couple of summers. And, but the thing is you'd have to get up. So I remember I played, I went to Cornell university Mm-hmm. Uh, it was that Syracuse, New York, mm-hmm. and and they did an EFY there on the campus of Cornell, and they their venue was I can't remember the name of the venue. It's the it's the it's like the Kingsbury Hall at the for university. You know, it's it's the it's the uh, it, it's a nice venue, and you go backstage and you see all the acts who perform there, these national acts, and I get up there alone with my guitar on this huge stage with with these kind of out of control kids because they've just come in from their sort of like games their their olympics the service the games and then like six hours of classes yeah and so if i can get through that hour alone with my guitar the rest of the trips paid for and 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 you know it was it was those were fun those were fun it was yeah we loved your shows we loved colors we loved all of it um Jeff Simpson was the pioneer of all that. He'd bring in all this high tech professional sound. So it was, it was high quality. Um, And that was the way that we got our music into the hands of that generation, because we were not able to advertise in church while we're at church or performing in church. One of the, things out of the handbook, the church handbook says that sacrament meetings should not be turned over to outside musical groups. And also that it should not bring attention to the artist. And there were what we call firesides. And this is like in the Christian market where you would go into a church and you would perform. Now the churches in the Protestant world, they actually pay the artist to come in. They sell tickets, they sell merchandise, they know that these are um, cross lighting musicians. And so they want to build them up and create a pop culture. So the youth and people gravitate to, to Christ. Whereas it was more controlled in the Mormon culture and these concerts went away. Yeah. Paul, it's a whole, that the topic you're touching on right now is a whole podcast in itself. And, and, and just how, the attitude taken towards the artists from whether it's an organization or whether it's a church or what, um, like you're talking about um, these artists being encouraged to pursue, to write their songs about God and to go out on the road and to proselytize. I mean, that the encouragement to do that. And it's very different in, in Mormonism, there's almost, um, it's almost, I don't know if you sense this because Paul, your music was kind of worshipful from yeah. the start. You couldn't escape it. Yeah. But as a contemporary artist, I felt um, like I, we always looked at a little bit with a little bit of mistrust. And we, um, you know, the, like we still like, uh, I like I, I haven't been doing as much lately, like, I haven't been getting as many calls for, but I did get a call uh, or an email just a a month ago to, to go perform 
for the general authorities at general conference the Monday night, mm -hmm. you know, at, before they all get, they all fly back to their areas, their assignments. And it's a dinner and I've done it before. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to do it. And I wrote back and I, I just said, well, tell me a little more so I can know how many musicians I should bring and how much I should charge. And they wrote back and said, Oh no, this is a longstanding policy that um, we don't pay the entertainment. And um, what we can offer is dinner with the general authorities, a, a good meal and a warm audience. It's exciting. And I, and I, I, I just, I wrote back and said, I'm honored you asked me, but I can't ask my musicians who are, they're all over the place in terms of their level of participation right now. And, hmm. and they're professional musicians. And I wouldn't have dared 20 years ago to, to, to just say no like that. But it, it, I, that I only tell them that story because it contrasts the attitude you just illustrated, you sort of, uh, the, the contrast in attitudes and the, maybe the encouragement. And we will be right back. Did you know the best way to support your favorite musician is to bypass social media and go to their website and subscribe to their mailing list? Going directly to the artist's website ensures you and the artist will have no third party controlling your relationship. It's a direct contact. Please show your support, particularly for our host. Go to Paul's website and subscribe, followed by other artists you enjoy. Visit www.paulcardall.com. Not only is Paul a podcast host, but has gifted the world with award-winning music that's brought comfort to millions of listeners in more than 160 nations. His latest album, Return Home, is an introspective listening experience. Each song, carefully crafted, takes listeners on a cinematic journey to the lands of his ancestors. In all, Return Home features 13 songs, from his original piano pieces, Shropshire Hills, Immigrant Ships, The Shores of Normandy, Red Poppy Fields, Fathers and Daughters, Eliza's Theme, to arrangements of popular hymns, I Believe in Christ and Love One Another. Whether you just need to relax, study, meditate, pray, or for some other healthy reason, Paul's music helps create an atmosphere of peace wherever you are. Add Paul Cardall's album, Return Home, to your favorite platform, whether it's iTunes, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, Pandora, or some other. For the sheet music and more information, visit www.paulcardall.com. Um, I was always a closeted, like Peter Brian Holt and Colors. I wanted to have a voice to sing. I want, you know, it's like I was following your band and... I wanted to be able to do those things, but the gift God gave me is play the piano, help people feel peace. And I've tried to do records, you know, where you have those vocals and they don't do as well. My wife always says, stick to piano, stick to piano. Yeah. I'm thinking about going to piano, Paul. <laughs> I don't, yeah, she, uh, yes. <laughs> Instrumental music is the tortoise in the market it just and now you have com apps and now you have we were doing that long before that uh me and steve and david tolk who is a billboard charting artist who his mother god bless her just passed she was a went to juilliard and she actually taught most of the major artists kids that are here in nashville like mm. everybody knew the tolks and so David is a product of that. And I encourage people to check out David's music. He's a huge influence on me. His song in reverence got me through a really hard time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in the contrast, I'll share with you my experience being invited. I was invited to play for the missionary fall social held at new skin. Missionary fall social at new skin. They have a general authority, <clears throat> general authority. These are the leaders of the church. These are the, for, if you're a Catholic, these are the cardinals. Um, they would gather a couple mission presidents, but they were general authorities and key people. I don't know who these key people are, but I was given the opportunity. They asked me, and I, I thought it was amazing that I got this opportunity to play some music and just share a story. But the rock and roller in me, 
I created a PowerPoint presentation and you had in the room that, that day, Elder Bednar, who's in line to become president of the church. He's young. He's amazing. One of my favorite people and uh, a good friend that kind of spurred out of that. I gave a bill, a, a, bull, a bullet. President Nelson was there, the, the current prophet of the church. President of the church. I played a couple songs. I played, you know, I played my hymns and Redeemer, uh, Gracie's theme, these songs that people like. And then I did this presentation and I brought up a quote that a lot of artists in LDS music draw back to that was given by Spencer W. Kimball, who was a prophet in the 70s. And he talked about how if we are a church that knows the truth, why don't we have better artists? Why don't we have the Michelangelos of the of, of the 20th century and the Beethovens, right? I know the yeah. time. Yeah, if you know <laughs> where you came from, who you are and where you're going, and you have, you know, all this additional canon, um, we should know how to create the finest work. And so so many of us in that world were I felt a lot of pressure on myself because I wanted to create classical music and do these things, but I couldn't do it. So I I presented this presentation. I said, look, the bottom line today, by the standards of our world, he's been vindicated because he said the day will come when there will be influential artists that do these things. And I pulled up the billboard chart, the classical chart. This is my world. And at the current time, there were six Latter-day Saints in the top 10 Wow! on the billboard charts. Uh, it was me, uh, the piano guys, Josh Wright, Tabernacle Choir, Lindsey Sterling, and there David was told David was on there, and I think it was on there. And 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 it was like I said, this is the influence and the importance of encouraging this industry to exist, that we ought to market commercially and get behind these artists. That was the day that Elder Bednar asked me to come to his office and then write that hymn with him that I really give credit to. I, I wrote the piano and helped him with the lyrics and all that stuff and um, put his name on everything. Um, and Steve, Stephen Sharp Nelson from the Piano Guys and Marshall McDonald, they came in and blew it up massive. Like it was this epic <laughs> anthem. <laughs> And then I went in Bednar's office and I presented to him the billboard chart. Yeah, right behind me on this side. And I presented it to him and I said, I think you're the first apostle to ever be in the top, to have a number one billboard record. He didn't know how to respond to that. Yeah, he's like, is that, do I like that or do I not like that? <laughs> yeah, because then it was like, I was trying to like, well, let's go do it with the choir. The Tabernacle Choir, let's have a concert. They let us have one concert in the Tabernacle, which was one of the most spiritual, amazing, powerful experiences of my life. We brought in Nathan Pacheco, that is a is an award-winning tenor that has kind of gone down the just focus on the that that commercial market and try try to go beyond that. But but I was like you in that moment of how do I present myself? And I took the approach of trying to educate, which you don't do. And this I thought, is this is at the concert. This is at the missionary. It, oh, at the New Skin. Hall. And this is, but you're in the church at this point. You're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was okay. I was okay, got in, it. but I was frustrated with a lot of things. Okay. Um, there were a lot of things uh, that that I was seeing that didn't coincide with the the things I had studied in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole season. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the bottom line is 
I was trying with the gift God gave me in covenanting to donate my time and talents to advise. Because I knew there were uh, there's advice. You'd get advisors and kind of guide the direction of the church to, to, to go in the right path. And fortunately, Elder Bednar was very supportive, did everything he could. But here's the thing. And, uh, I pro you know, they wouldn't want me to share this, but he said to me, how much control do you want of this song? I said, I want to own it on my album and I'll give your songwriting credit to, to you. And he goes, I don't want it. Uh, give it to the missionary department. He had no interest in receiving any money from it. It was his goal to just get the message out there that he felt was so strong that Jesus loves us individually. And it's an individual thing. He was so supportive that he, I, I met with one of the attorneys of the church and they worked out a contract where I was able to have rights to the master recording that I had created. Nice. They did their standard arrangement for the church website, you know, that was very straightforward. So everybody could sing it. And uh, yeah, so that was my, my, st my stint at that. And I think, you know, you probably had an amazing experience, but, and I had amazing experience, but there is this level of, I think we all want more to happen because we've been so involved passionately in the industry. Yeah. You know, you're on the out, you know? Do you know, do you know Trina Harmon? Uh, -uh. maybe I, now, now I've said her name. I shouldn't, uh, I don't know. This is a pri private conversation I had with her. Okay. But she, she, you know, she's a, she's amazing. She's a songwriter in Nashville. But she's also a very intuitive person. And she's actually found that she's very effective at kind of coaching songwriters. Like, like she taps into the, you know, she understands songwriting, but she's also a very spiritual person and intuitive person. So she's able to coach. And so there was a time when, when, uh, because Russ Dixon met her and, introduced her to a bunch of people in salt lake you know next thing you know she's having weekly calls with mindy gledhill and yeah alex boyer and i'm just naming people but um yeah christian art or, or lds artists yeah and she she said to me so we met russ put the two of us on a panel together at a, at a conference he put together and we hit it off on the panel you know we and, and i'm like can i can I call you? Like she said this interesting thing to me. She said, Oh, you're Peter Brownhill. I've heard they told me about you. She said, You're the pioneer. And I didn't know what she meant by that. But um, and I said, Oh, yeah, I'm I I got don't really know where I am right now or something, like career-wise. I said something about um my audience. And she said, Ooh, there's she went like this. Ooh, there's a lot going on inside of there. We need to talk. So we ended up having several, you know, number of conversations on the phone. And she said very early on to me, she said, I, you know, I'm talking to a lot of these Mormon artists and I got to tell you, you're such good people and you're so devoted to your, to the church. Mm -hmm. She's, and then she added, but I, I, I think I've yet to meet one or there are very few of you who are truly aligned with your mission. And I thought that was fascinating because when she said that, I was like, I know what you're saying. Um, there's a devotion to the, to the church, to the, to the external church. And that demands a lot of service and inside a lot of creative people feel out of step with their own vision for their own work, their yeah. own creative work. And so I started asking myself, so what is it that leads all these sincere, artistic, creative people and all the good and the bad that comes with that temperament? What is it that is leading creative people in the Mormon community to feel uh, sort of at odds with it at the same time? Uh -huh. And I don't know if you related to that when you were in, but there was a, you know, that, I, I'm still unpacking it in my life. Any music that points people to the son of God, I champion that. So any music from any culture, any faith that points people to the master healer, I'm, I'm, I advocate. And I thought one of the things that was so powerful with you is even though you're more commercially um, 
viable to where there's people all over the country and probably in the world that have passed your music on to other people that still ties you to your roots, you know? And now we're seeing Paul Simon. Oh yeah. Seven Psalms. Paul Simon, who is getting older and knows he's going to die with his wife, Edie Brickell. Mm -hmm. Great match. She's guided him and helped him. And he has done this album that tries to bring perspective to his life of who is God. And we see all these artists, the Johnny Cashes, the Merle Haggards, the even Bono. You know, yeah. Bono gets, if you go to a Coldplay concert, yeah, their, their stage is across. Um, even Cat Stevens, who was drawn to the Islamic faith and was very distant in, in having his name commercialized until his son said it's time dad yeah <clears throat> interesting <laughs> interesting word right it's not time blah da, da. yeah yeah father and son <laughs> comes full circle and his son is preserving his legacy so yeah i don't i don't mean to get super emotional but i've always advocated and tried to tell artists and i may have been you know a, a smart aleck with you that it is so vital that because the gift God has given you to, to, to speak of the struggle. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, we got a, we have a daughter going on a mission and without going into a whole nother podcast, you know, Beck and I who have both, both were missionaries and we're aware of the challenges and we're aware of, aware of the, the good and the, and the, the struggles you know, we're sending her off and we're, we both, we're a little conflicted, both of us. Um, because as you know, Paul, that those experiences can be on the one hand, deeply transformative. It, it was deeply transformative to me, but it can also tilt into um, kind of a numbers thing and kind of a, 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 a sort of salesy thing. And anyway, one of the things we told her recently is is a story we heard, and you know the people in this story. There was a somebody we knew served a mission in Texas about ten years ago, and this is a creative kid. This is a kid who's now, you know, writing his own books, and and um, you know, he could end up with a mission president that is very straight out of the business world, mm -hmm. and and that's going to be hard on on a kid like that. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, he was sent to a, a mission that had a mission president who had a different attitude. And he said in a conference once to the mission, he said, I want you to think of missionary work this way. If, if there's a big circle and Jesus is at the center of the circle, any interaction you have with any person, if you can bump them a little closer mm -hmm. to Jesus, that's mission. You're doing missionary work yeah. for a mission president to say that. What a great thing. And so we've said to our daughter, you know, we don't know anything about your mission culture, but as far as your parents are concerned, yeah. anytime you bump anybody a little closer to the center of that circle, you're doing missionary work. And I think that ties to what you're saying to musicians too. Like, you know, I, I've always been very, you know me, Paul, I've always been a little uncomfortable getting, letting my music get too close to the structural version of, of, of the faith. Yeah. I, I, I don't like, I don't know what it is about it. I've always preferred to kind of take as my standard. If somebody can hear what about and feel a little closer to the center of that circle, you know, John Denver can do that. Paul Simon can do that. John Lennon can do that. That's I right. Don't care. <laughs> right. And there's this, I mean, that's my, that's, those are, that's my intention. And you know, it's, I'm sorry that sometimes we all get all messed up inside and, and artists in particular who are often sen sen you know, sensitive people. And um, like, like Trina Harmon said, a lot of people can be very devout and think they're doing and trying hard, but deep down they're feeling out of alignment with something deeper. Yeah. Andrew Peterson. And I, I, Thank you for sharing that because in your music, 
I do hear the gospel. What about um, so many of your songs? What about probably one of the best songs I've ever heard? Mm. And uh, every time I listen to it, it just brings so much perspective of gratitude. If I've ever, if I'm ever feeling just burned out, you know, um, with the challenges of the world, I, I put that song on. Um, so yeah, I think, and maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe you, <clears throat> this is your gift of the way you direct people, the way God has worked through you to direct people. Um, Andrew Peterson, who is a songwriter, really respected. I consider Andrew Peterson, the Peter Brinehold of the Nashville community, hmm. because the people that are killing it in the big market of Christian music, they, they listen to Andrew, but Andrew doesn't have the praise and worship of the world. Hmm. I just said is why, why church leaders don't want Latter-day Saints to, to be, I think, too far out there in connection with the church. They want them to focus solely on the leaders. And there's also a sort of suspicion. Have you sensed this, Paul, that there's a, uh, in our culture, there's a little bit of, um, what's, the, what's the word? There's a little bit of uh, reluctance on the part of the leaders towards stars, towards if, if, you, if you're really charismatic, you're going to draw people to you and not to, you know, I, I did a fireside once and then the the guy in the state presidency, you know, he, he saw that I was connecting with the youth and he gets up after and he's, it's like he has to set the record straight. He's like, you know, there was once he gave this parable, there was once a village and they had a treasure and they put the treasure in a beautiful box and the box was ornate itself and everybody fell in love with the box and they forgot about the treasure inside the box. And he's like, brothers and sisters, Peter Brinehold is the box. <laughs> he's not the treasure. And I'm like, I didn't say I was the box. I'm. You guys asked me to come and, and share. And I guess I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that there's in our culture, I think there's a particular um, reluctance or maybe guardedness about like i you know there's a musician you and i both know um who's also teaches religion he's a seminary teacher and yeah one of his interviews with his bosses you know the area director was kind of he seemed in this interview it was like a quarterly check-in he was like how's this music thing going on the side and, and he seemed concerned about it and he finally said i just want to make sure you are a kingdom builder and not a you built, you know, a blank, blank builder. I won't say his name. And I heard that story and I'm like, that's a, you know, that's not uncommon for creative people to, to feel that sort of, you know, yeah. uh, you know, like it's selfish or it's self-aggrandizing or it's all about you. And I, I know in this case, that's not what he's doing. So that we have a little mistrust in our culture for the artist. There is, and I'll, <clears throat> I'll say it, there's a lot of narcissism that's bred because there is the knowledge uh, or the idea that you are a king someday. And so you kind of see the world with glasses um, in sometimes in your mind equal to God. And so you're looking down on people that don't have that same covenant. And for me, I needed to remove all the idols that stand in my way of having a real intentional relationship with Jesus. I mean, and when you say idols, you're talking about the stuff that's coming between you and God. It's the stuff, it's the intermediary people, it's the leaders, it's the structure itself. It's the, it's the, uh, you know, there's, yeah, there's tell me. a lot of open interpretation. Um, as you read the new Testament, I've always wrestled with that. Because in, you have four gospels. They all tell the same story, but they all disagree on details. But I think you're, Paul, you're, you're tapping onto, you're tapping into it. The, the whole using, and I hope I didn't interrupt you, but the, you're fine, but you using the creative process as songwriters in, in, 
as a as an as a parallel to trying to describe the religious experience. It, I think it's like I feel like I you and I both know what it's like to write a song and then you you look at it and you're like, "Whoa, that's beyond me. Well, how did that happen? Where did that come from?" And I think that's all over I don't care what your every religion that you know the origin stories are beyond like how did whoa how did that happen and so I like you I think I have you know sympathy for the the message keepers <laughs> because right. it's it's it is a it it is an intangible it is a intangible thing it's like trying to describe I mean that's why you do art you do art to convey what you can't convey in words. And you know, I love I love when early when James Taylor was, you know, just starting out, somebody interviewed him and they're like, so tell me what Carolina in my mind means. And he's like, he just was at a loss. And he was like, that's why I wrote the song. You're mm -hmm. to, to say something I can't say with words. Mm -hmm. And and it doesn't all add up sometimes. It's more about the way it makes you feel. And so I think you and I, I liked when you did that because I thought you talk about you talk about any any religious leader who has had a, a sort of uh, brush with God, yeah, I think the creative process gives us a little bit of insight. This was a question that um, Kurt Bester once brought up: is that even in our sins, we create oh the Sorry. most <laughs> magical, powerful, influential things, and so I can't say, oh, Joseph Smith is a rotten person. What I can say is he gave us, uh, gave the world a book, whether it's canon or not, that tells people that if you keep the commandments, you'll have joy. Now, the Christian angle is you'll have joy knowing that Jesus is coming to your rescue, you know? So it's it's just packaged they're all patty. They all have that box with a nice bow on it. Yeah. Every yep. church. And so every pastor gets excited and feels called. Every person, there's people that feel called. They become pastors. They bring people into the living room. It expands out. And then there's a thousand people. And then they go, Hey, we need to build a building. Can you put up some money? And that's always when the church starts to go through their financial. Right. And that's when problem. I'll, I'll quote our own. Hugh Nibley gave that great talk, the sh the fatal shift from leadership to management. Yeah, another podcast in itself, where we go from innovating to protecting what 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 has worked. And and I mean, this topic is so. I I mean, I guess I've already stated it, but the fact that like, I think because you're creative, Paul, and you're a composer, like you're 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 experiencing some insight to 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 this question. I mean, there's a, so do you remember Arthur Henry King? He, he, he was from England. He was a convert yeah. taught at BYU for years, mm -hmm. taught literature. And I remember um, in, uh, they printed one of his, a uh, piece of it, one of his books in the enzyme when I was on in a missionary down in Chile. Mm -hmm. And I told, we talked earlier about how, you know, Back in the 80s, and for a 19-year-old mind, you're asking yourself, so is this, can this be a good song? If if John Lennon wrote this song that makes me feel good, but John Lennon, you know, did drugs and <laughs> did terrible things, you know, whatever the narrative is. How could he write a good song? I mean, I just remember specifically, I was thinking about John Lennon. That's and that, was that that is what Salieri in the film Amadeus. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to do everything right. I'm going to abstain. I'm going to, you know, be, be abstinent. God, just make me great. Yeah. Give me the music, which is the wrong approach. But here he looks at this. Mozart, Mozart. idiot. It's, not, it's, it's <laughs> totally not a true story. But he looks at Mozart and he's just vulgar. Yeah. You get yeah. that. You get that in the letters he wrote to his his wife, but I find him adorable. But he's just vulgar and the great masses... In fact, I asked uh, Tina to marry me in the church that he attended uh, every day. Mm. Asked back then was only 20 minutes. Um, and every day, because every day, and uh, until he was, until his father um, let him go to, 
let him leave. And then he stopped going to mass every day. But that speaks to the same thing, Paul. And so our, so I'm a missionary and I'm thinking like, what is a good song, first of all? And does it have to come from a good tree? And I'm having these questions. And I read this article by Arthur Henry King, you know, who who's comes from comes from England. He's a convert. So he has a, different, a fresh perspective. And he said, it's very important for us to remember that many times when there are many times bad people are trying to be good people. And in the moment they're trying to be good people, they produce great work. And I go a step further and say, we're all bad people trying to be good people. And in the effort, in the, in the effort of trying to be good and turn to God, we're open to goodness and great inspiration. And so um, I thought that was great. And to take it a step further. So there's an article in the Salt Tribune. I don't know when this came out. You read the Salt Lake Tribune? Yeah, don't tell your dad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's I say that because Deseret Book, Deseret News is the is like a sister company of Deseret Book. So uh um and then Salt Lake Tribune is tend to be a little controversial because it's they're not pro LDS culture. So they're right. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 let's just say what I'm about this article I'm about to cite couldn't have been printed in the Deseret News probably wouldn't have been. Oh, so so Ma- this is the first step to apostasy. I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's Matthew Bowman or Bowman. I don't know how you say it. I don't know if you read, and I, I don't know much about him. But somebody sent it to me, and he's talking about. I don't know if this is unique to Mormon culture or if this is Christian culture, but he talks about in scriptures. You, there's a you you have to dif- differentiate between the prophet role and the high priest role mm-hmm. so, so so it's for it's very familiar to you because the book of mormon there's always a high priest and then there's prophets mm-hmm. and they're different prophets are born they're born with natural gifts and 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 you never know when they're going to pop up and it's not you're not called i mean you're not called by uh, an organization to be you know in the scriptural you you know you just emerge and you have these gifts and you can say things that indicate what may happen in the future. And his point in this article is that in modern Mormonism, we've conflated the two into one role, into one person. And then he goes to point out and say, and this is why I'm telling you this, the prophetic role, the prophetic spirit, just speaking of our culture, Mormon culture, I see into, I see signs of prophetic vision all over the place. Mm -hmm. I see it in, I see it in, Teen, you know, you say young people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I see it in poets. I see it in in writers. I see it, you know, in in the everyday person who just has insight and sees things, you know, a certain way. So it's out there. The prophetic yeah. vision's out there. But our custom is to call one person the prophet and his body of you know the of the quorum, and that's where the that's where the revelation for the church comes yeah and that to me is more of a high priest those are that's the high priest role the, the high priest's role is to um run you know kind of protect the rituals to, to yes. re- protect the the ordinances and to keep the organization running it's been super cool for me to in my mind make that dis- distinction because i think artists are often you know yeah being 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 the they often have the prophetic voice artists influence culture and how culture shifts yeah you know and because i'm so artistic you're emotional about a lot of things and you analyze everything and you try to figure out how things work and i mean this is a bad comparison but like we see visitors welcome and anyone can go to the LDS church and missionaries bring people. We invite friends and neighbors. But then I always thought, wouldn't it be nice if there was an ashtray outside? Hmm. Because that right there signals anyone is welcome. But yeah. these are the little things that I go, why am I thinking about this? Because <laughs> you're hurt. <laughs> well, because of what you said, and and I like that intersection that we're talking about. Even like Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon, it's like, I mean, my, my take on it is 
is unique, but it's 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 informed by my experience of like of, of back back to writing the song mm -hmm. and the um the whole is with the what is it the whole is greater than the sum of its parts you you uh, you just don't know what's going on you're improvising and then all of a sudden lightning strikes i mean that's the tricky thing um about creative work is that you're trying to catch lightning yeah and sometimes you're just waiting you're waiting and you're waiting yeah. and, and sometimes lightning will strike in a song and it'll give you a chorus but it won't give you a verse yeah so you wait for lightning to strike again and then you get hung you know it's it's excruciating sometimes <laughs> yeah i mean i work best when i'm up against a deadline yeah like i can't even prepare i go mad i go mad and i don't want to come home super grumpy so, I mean, this little piano right here has been destroyed a couple of times. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I remember producing that first DFY album and I got a glimpse into how, like, for example, there was a line in a song that said the the wind, somebody wrote, Greg Simpson wrote this song. Actually, this was the previous year, but he'd written a song that had the line, the wind of high adventures whipping through my veins. Mm. And the person above him the, who had, to, you know, because the lyrics have to be approved. Mm -hmm. So the person above him, whoever that was, was like, I think it's fine, but I bet the elder so-and-so will think that if you say hi and veins and adventure all in the same sentence, then that's a drug that could be interpreted as a drug reference. So let's go ahead and change that line. Now, there was no elder anybody who said anything about the song. It was all in the mind of this. And that's how a bureaucracy works. It's like there's a lot of I don't want to I don't want him to think that I didn't catch that line. So I'm going to go ahead and change it. So by the time it gets to the, you know, the flag gets to the top of the pole, it's a it's a it's a product by committee or a, a bunch of projection of what, you know, may happen. And the whole thing has been watered down. Why did I get off on this other than well, um, <clears throat> some of that about how they control art? Some of that I experienced when I, when Elder Bednar asked me to to do this song with him. The lyrics are all taken out of the Book of Mormon, and you can find these same lyrics um, in the Bible. So he took the the standard verses that communicate like a king james version the thou thine um which they they argue over <laughs> can we say i love you lord or i love thee thou thine and you're like the thou thine that's the trinity anyway sorry so um a whole other podcast yeah it's a lot to say on that <laughs> it's controlled art and um the verses just fit in perfectly with the melody you know, it was pretty much a nursery rhyme melody. And um, I said, he was at Home Depot when I called him and um, working on his roof. Hmm. I said, don't you have people that do that? He goes, no, I, I want to work on it. But once we finally completed the song and I had, and it was done, this is before the attorney. And I went to lunch at the, the restaurant up there at the top of the Joseph Smith building where they do the deals. I don't know if that's where they do the deals, but um he he said and and the quorum of the 12 and the first presidency's offices are in a smaller building beautiful gorgeous building next to the lion house where brigham young lived so behind it is a massive building and that is the administration the 70s the bishop the kind of the business of the church the the physical business and some of the spiritual but over in the apostles building it's it's where they focus on the ordinances and um what they believe people need and so he looks and he goes he says to me well i think it's great but we got to send it over there mm. <laughs> he goes i and he was like i'm pretty new to this whole thing and i'm learning the procedures but we'll send it over there and see what happens and then we'll get the attorney involved and uh I think he's okay if I if I say that, but that's that's the truth. And he's really been very effective at managing because he was a professor at I think it was 
Pepperdine or Purdue. And then a president of a university later. Wrote the textbook on behavioral management in business. Yeah. So they got a guy who knows how to manage. And if there's any problems in scattering, he can build with what he's got to expand. You remember, you remember uh, Wallace, uh, what was his first name? 60 Minutes. Mike. Mike Wallace came and talked to Gordon B. Hinckley in the 90s. And yeah. uh, and Gordon B. Hinckley, who's president of the church, is kind of known for his candor. And then, and uh, they were, and they really hit it off, I guess. And they're, you know, Gordon B. Hinckley has given Mike Wallace a tour of the Temple Square. And Michael, Mike Wallace points to the big, tall church office building and said, well, what's that? And he said, oh, that's the church office where the employees of the church, where the church business, that's where the employees of the church work. And Mike Wallace says, wow, how many employees are there? And Gordon Mangel said, too many. <laughs> that's, that's so true. And that sounds like one thing my mission president used to say, he was manager of church curriculum. He said, the last thing the church needs is another book. And he used to tell us, look, the former mission president who compiled all these additional rules, get rid of it. Because the apostles had put together this little tiny pocket pamphlet, and that's what you go by. But guess what happened at the end of his mission? We we can't what it got thicker. He <laughs> we added, can't help ourselves. Like he, you know, where it says bathe frequently or shower frequently. He stood up in a conference and had a couple of us stand up, and he said, "Listen, go open to this page where it says bathe frequently. Cross it out and say cross out." cross out frequently and put every day because if you're stinky and you're going into somebody's home, yeah. you're not going to be focused. They're going to be like, man, this kid stinks. Does he have a mother? <laughs> Little things like that. It's like, why are they thinking about this? Worrying about that stuff. And those are the things where I was like, ah, yes. and I don't see, and I see the way, you know, we all read the gospels with the eyes we have to read, but I, I see a guy who was still very much part of the culture he was raised in, but peeling, trying to peel back layers yeah. that, that the fairs that had piled up over centuries and trying to get to the core, the core thing of connecting people back to God. And he's done that. Um, anyways, I'm sure this has been a fascinating Let's do a part two. Yeah, we should someday a, a fascinating, uh, rabbit hole we've gone down as artists this is what happens in the green room <laughs> when when peter has his green m&ms my cereal boxes you used to have cereal boxes in the behind no I'm, I'm making fun of shoop who oh. specifies in his tech writer that he has to have certain cereal <laughs> yeah ryan shoop and the rubber band they are a great band check them yeah. out as well yeah. their song dream Dream big actually had some good radio play, but did you know it takes one million dollars to break an artist onto radio here in Nashville? We, uh, there, the the we would all like to think that that uh, like the vision I have of the sixties is that there's some DJ in California and he's like he finds mm -hmm. this he hears this song by this band out of Malibu and he's like, Hey, check this out, kids. I'm going to spin this, this, tell me what you think. And people would hear it, call in, say, play that again. And that this pure sort of free market way of, of music, just sort of right. The hit, the good songs rising to the surface. Yeah. And it wasn't even like that back then. There was a lot of behind the, there's a lot of politics, but nothing like it is. Now. Yeah. And I think even desert book, you know, it is a weird sort of feedback loop that happens between customer and, and I mean, the pure, you know, I think the internet's helped. I think probably just big time, big time. Other than you have a hundred thousand songs on average show up every Friday on Spotify because everybody can make music now using garage band loops uh, or whatever. But um, yeah, it's fascinating because like, and we'll close, but, I think one more about the EFY records, it seemed like to me that it was very much the same as the model that is today with radio, because they tell you, businesses tell you what you need to listen to. They put what they feel, what they believe is going to sell trucks, sell beer, sell whatever they've got at the, at the, at the show. 
there's some really good Christian artists who, you know, they, they have a cause wherever they are, whatever they do, but it's all radio telling you what to listen to. And it's a very small group of people. And it's the same, uh, I think, amount of people that were working on the EFY records behind the scenes. As like, oh. this goes on, this goes on, this goes on. Well, not only that, but the, but the, cause you, and you've worked with, so Desert Book, which is owned by the church. So uh-huh. if you're a devout member of the church and you want, you don't really know what you want to go read or what book to buy or what yeah. music to listen to, you'll go to the, one of the stores and you walk in and there's a bestsellers mm-hmm. list. Now, whether those are true bestsellers or not, that's a, that's something we can talk about later but the fact is they'll go in and say oh here's what's selling right now meanwhile i'll buy that meanwhile um the people making decisions at desert book you know in their minds are like we want to follow what the customer That's wants cool. so yeah. so the customer is saying desert book you tell me and desert book is saying to the customer well, you tell me and it's a feedback loop and so you get this kind of distorted version of free market and and it's it's weird, and so you, there's some very very talented authors who who never rise to the top in our culture, right? And and right. then there's some then there's some then there's some no, maybe not so talented uh, authors or or musicians who do rise to the top, yeah. and it's a it's a weird and I know that exists everywhere, but it's got a particular particularly strange look here in our culture. Yeah, I mean it's controlled for the best interest. Of the people. And I, I appreciate it. You know, my kids, if they were to go into Deseret book, I appreciate what's in there. They know they can get, um, things elsewhere. They, um, I had my daughter, Eden, who is, you know, going to be 18. She's a musician. She released a single, wants to release a ton more, but I'm making her work for it. And, um, you know, I had her vote for the Dove Awards. And so that exposed her to all these new artists that are not Paramore. And um, she's listening to all this fun, cool music that we wanted back in the time when we were doing a lot of music. Of course, I had to stay on topic, but, you know, and, and I'll add this, when Amy Grant got divorced. The Vince? I, Amy Grant got divorced. You know, she's married to Vince Gill now. Now, but her first, okay, got it. Yeah, her first husband was abusive but she didn't publicly acknowledge that so lifeway which has stores like deseret book everywhere in the christian market control kind of what goes in there and so when she got divorced they pulled her music amy grant whoa and listen i i scored the soundtrack to ephraim's rescue oh yeah yeah you had your own story and then i was going through divorce and i i went you know we went through with the divorce which was awful. I don't recommend divorce. Um, but they pulled the contract, like they broke contract to pull the music off the shelf. And that was going to be my income, you know, to, to try to maneuver through. Cause I was still trying to build a business, but that's, that's kind of the interesting, but look, this happens in every corporate company. This is everywhere. It's, yeah, Artists just get frustrated because we want change. You know, you go back to music from long ago. It always evolves and changes because artists are willing to to do it. You know, you go back to Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. There was a cardinal that yeah. he, he couldn't stand. And so uh, the, didn't like his work. So he wanted him to to cut off all the 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 uh how do i say it the package of every statue and every painting so he made him a devil and put him in the corner <laughs> <laughs> so there's layers of all that stuff in music so anyways peter yeah let's do this again yeah we didn't even get into your songwriting class and some of the travels your family has done and cuz i love how you're raising your family mm. you guys are not living in the box you are all over the place. And I, I yeah. love Yeah. Yeah. So much so that when my daughter gets a mission call to Texas, she's really, really frustrated. <laughs> but they're she's going to have a great experience. Oh, it's discipline. They're teaching her discipline. <laughs> but is she going to speak Spanish? Yeah. Well, there you go. So it's going to be 
she'll be working with immigrants. She'll be working with, it'll be a cultural experience. All right, brother. Miramar. Okay, thanks, Paul. Adios, muchachos. See ya. It's been said that to live is to sorrow. It's been said that there's no room for tomorrow. So men stand there and stare at the twilight. And they work out each day as it seems right. But oh, I knew we would shine, so I say hallelujah sometimes. And I think now, all oh, this time has been on this road. And what about all the September moon?